We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the title of my sermon this morning is simply an Advent message. We're going to take a break from Romans this week and concentrate on a season in which we find ourselves in this time of year. We call it Advent. What is Advent, you might ask? A couple of people were talking this morning and said they don't even really know what Advent is. And you know what? Until I studied for the message, I, I wasn't really sure what it was either. I kind of knew what time of year it happened and everything. But what is it? It's not just lighting candles each week for hope and peace and joy and love. That's what you light the four candles for. It's not just about putting together a bunch of Advent wreaths. It's not just setting up a nativity scene. By the way, that was inspired by St. Francis way back when. And it's certainly not just opening another door on your cardboard Advent calendar so you can enjoy another piece of candy. When I thought of Advent, that's what I thought about. My Advent calendar, right? Had those for years, right? Yeah. It's more. It's more than that. Advent is more than the symbols that we've come to associate with this season. It comes from the Latin word aventus, which means coming or approach or arrival. Therefore, Advent serves as the anticipation of Christ's birth in the season leading to Christmas. That's only part of the story. Advent is the season of reflection, preparation for Christ's nativity at Christmas. And for us as believers, it's also preparation for Christ's expected return as his second coming. So we celebrate Advent in remembrance of Christ's first coming. And we we celebrate Advent for us now in anticipation of his second coming. That's pretty cool. And Advent also symbolizes the church present situation in these days. The verse I put in your bulletins this morning, Acts 2.17, says this. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. That's what the Jews were waiting for. Messiah. That's what we're waiting for in Jesus returning, right? God's going to pour out His Spirit on all of us. As God's people, we wait for the return of Christ to this world to initiate the beginning of His eternal kingdom. I love what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said. He was a German Christian theologian. In his day, he often spoke against the Nazi rule, especially against anti-Semitism. And he was executed by Hitler by hanging in 1945 after he was linked to an attempted assassination of Hitler. And anyone who's been around for a while has probably at least heard the name Dietrich Bonhoeffer, if not read some of his writings. This is what Bonhoeffer has to say about Advent. The celebration of Advent is possible only to those who are troubled in soul, who know themselves to be poor and imperfect, and who look forward to something greater to come. In other words, Christians are the perfect candidates to celebrate Advent, right? (laughs) Because that's where we're all at, right? To reflect upon that thought, some churches often repeat this famous catechism with their children in their church every week. Here's how it goes. What season are we celebrating? Advent. What is Advent? Advent is the season before Christmas. What kind of season is Advent? Advent is a season of waiting. Where are we waiting? In the land of deep darkness. What are we waiting for? The light to shine upon us. What do we do during Advent? Prepare our hearts to welcome Jesus. What do we confess during Advent? 
Christ had come and Christ will come again. That catechism will be the theme of my message this morning. According to Scripture, what are the events of Advent, of the first Advent? We start with the witness of John the Baptist. Scripture says he was a prophet like Elijah. John bore witness to Jesus. He was born to a barren woman that brought great joy to her and all of those around her. And his God-given mission of preparing the world for the Messiah brought great joy to the world as well. He turned people back to the Lord. His message of repentance is a necessity for anybody who has truly come to Christ. We are all addicted to sin, right? We are all addicted to sin. That's one of the points we make in Ready Now Recovery. We are all addicted to sin. And last week in our class, Ready Now Recovery, we said this, in order to break addiction, first you must stop doing what you're doing. Then you need to shift your focus. Isn't that the perfect description of repentance? The perfect description of repentance is stop doing what you're doing and shift your focus. Right? That was the message of John the Baptist. From the womb, John the Baptist was celebrating his cousin Jesus. <laughs> and even in the womb, right? He leaped for joy when Mary approached Elizabeth, right? Throughout John's life, he would live so as to draw attention to Jesus so that Jesus became greater and John became less. That was something he said himself. Next is the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary submitted to the angel's message, unlike Zechariah, who had doubts. She sang her beautiful song, the song called Magnificent, which is not just a personal celebration of God's favor, but it's her hymn of praise to God. Here's what that song says. He is the holy and mighty one who gives mercy from generation to generation. He shows his strength, not by recruiting the strong, but by scattering the proud, bringing down the mighty, and exalting the humble, and satisfying the hunger and the poor. And he does all this in faithfulness to his promises with the ultimate aim that we would magnify the Lord by rejoicing in Him. Just as John did. And then we saw that Mary, just like John the Baptist, points us to her son. She is blessed, she is favored, but her son is the son of the Most High, the son of David, the son of God, born by the Holy Spirit in the womb of a virgin. And then along with Mary is Jesus' earthly father, Joseph. Joseph had numerous great qualities such as tenderness and courage and being a self-giving person. Someone once wrote, Fathers are not born, but made. Whenever a man accepts responsibility for the life of another, he becomes a father to that person. And that is exactly what Joseph did with God's son. He was a man who carried out his important role in the family without complaint and with hope and joy. He answered God's call in his life with unwavering obedience and courage and no grumbling or complaints. I wish I could say that was true about me all the time, right? Then comes the story of the father of John. His doubts led to nine months of silence. But he made the most of those nine months. For nine months, the angel's words boiled and bubbled in his soul. 
so that when God finally loosed his tongue, Zechariah erupted like Mary did with a spirit-inspired song of praise to God. And Zechariah's story centers on mercy, the practical mercy of a baby born to a barren woman. The promised mercy flowing from God's covenant with Abraham and David. The mercy that delivers us from enemies and sets us free to serve God without fear. And we serve God in holiness and righteousness. And finally, the tender mercies of God that forgives our sins and gives light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and guides our feet into the way of peace. Luke 2 introduces us to one of the most familiar stories in the Bible. You've heard Linus read this story in the Charlie Brown Christmas special every year since you were a kid. Right? Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Remember Linus? You say that, right? Every year. Right? You know all about the decree of Caesar Augustus and the journey to Bethlehem and no room for them in the end. And then we have the story of the shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night, common, hard-working, blue-collar men. And the angels come in glory, and the heavenly army sings glory to God in the highest. And then the shepherds go to find out if what they were told was true. And they find the baby Jesus, just as they were told. And then we're told of two people who were living lives of Advent. More than just the short time before Jesus came, but for a long time they were living lives of Advent. First was Anna, the prophetess, the woman who had been widowed for 50 or 60 years, praying and fasting daily in the temple, and she gives thanks to God when she sees Jesus. The redemption of Jerusalem is what she called him. And then at the temple there was an old man named Simeon who was waiting for the consolation of Israel, knowing that God had promised him that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. He sings a song of praise to God also. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. All of those people that I mentioned were living in deep darkness, waiting for the light to shine upon them. At the center of the story is the angelic announcement that Linus faithfully declared, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The great joy is for all the people because Jesus is the Savior. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. And these three great titles, Savior, Messiah, and Lord, stand at the center of the Christmas story. He is the Savior, as Simeon says. He is the salvation prepared in the presence of all people. He saves us from our enemies, from the world, from our flesh, and from the devil. He saves us from our sins. He delivers all who trust in Him, whether Jews or Greeks, from God's judgment. He is the Messiah, the anointed King of Israel, who sits on the throne of His father David, now remember, 
This is an Advent sermon. I want you to notice the progression as it builds to the angelic announcement. I want you to hear this story with Advent ears. So put on your Advent ears. Okay? What kind of season is Advent? Advent is a season of waiting. What are we waiting for? Or where are we waiting? We're waiting in the land of deep darkness. Consider the variety of people who are waiting in this land of deep darkness. There's an old, respectable, childless couple, descendants who can trace their lineage back to the days of David and even Moses. There's a teenage peasant girl who is in the midst of planning her wedding. There's a young man awaiting his marriage, trying to do and make the right choices in life. And then consider the dirty, lower class, rough around the edges shepherds as they guard their flocks from thieves and wolves. Consider the old righteous man living in Jerusalem and the old woman praying at the temple. Young, old, rich, poor, married, widowed, unmarried, the story contains all types of people. Now consider the darkness these people are dwelling in. Consider the deep darkness of infertility. Consider the shame and reproach that only a barren woman knows. It might seem strange to be ashamed of infertility and barrenness, it's not like Elizabeth could help it. But a wise man once said, sometimes we're most ashamed of the things we can't help. Consider the deep darkness of a man whose ancestors reach back over a thousand years, does not have any children to continue his line. Consider the deep darkness of the poor and those oppressed by the proud and mighty like Mary and Joseph and the shepherds who know hunger and thirst and need and want. The shepherds sleep outside in the winter. This young girl is going to give birth in a manger. Consider the deep darkness of those who sit in the shadow of death, like the old man in Jerusalem just waiting to die. Consider the deep darkness of loneliness, like the old woman who lives at the temple because her husband died decades ago. Now go back even further into the deep darkness. Go back to Genesis. Listen with Advent ears. Hear the story of those Old Testament people Consider the deep darkness that hovered over Cain and Abel, one brother murdering another. Consider the deep darkness of a man who lost everything, even his ten children and his wife who said to just curse God and die. Consider the deep darkness of the jealousy and strife between two twin brothers, Jacob and Esau, who battled each other even from the womb. Consider the deep darkness and the jealousy and rivalry of two wives, Rebecca and Leah, whose father used them and manipulated them into marrying the same man. Consider the deep darkness of Jacob as he wrestled with God and his promises in the night and then limped for the rest of his life. Consider the deep darkness of a family torn apart by jealousy and envy and 11 brothers that sell their own brother into slavery. And then consider the deep and tumultuous darkness of that man's story as he's thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, raises in Potiphar's house through his faithfulness, only to be falsely accused and thrown into prison where he's forgotten by men of power whom he helped, but then he was left to rot. 
consider the deep darkness of all those other characters in Scripture and every light waiting for the light to come and shine upon them. Advent is a season of waiting. All these saints from Scripture were waiting in the land of deep darkness for the light to come and shine upon them. But then consider, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. The light at the end of the tunnel is the announcement of two births. Listen how the light begins to dawn in their darkness. Notice how the story builds from when Gabriel announces good news to Zechariah. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. And then it builds as Gabriel brings God's favor to Mary, promising the birth of the Son of the Most High. And Mary and Elizabeth meet, and John leaps for joy in the womb because he knows the Lord is near. The light is coming. And then as John is born, the one who will prepare the way, we hear Zechariah celebrate the tender mercies of God that will give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And these notes of joy and light and peace build until one night in the bleak midwinter, the darkest time of the year, when you can have a candlelight service at 6 p.m. like we do because the sun has already gone down. Okay? <laughs> In the land of deep darkness, the light bursts forth. It shocks some sleepy shepherds. Blazing glory, brilliant light, bright shining, the good news of great joy for all people, triumph, splendor that scatters fear and a heavenly army heralding peace on earth. Now we can sing our Christmas songs with great joy. Joseph, joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Gloria in excelsis Deo. O come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him. Born the king of angels. Come let us adore him and so the call goes out come to Bethlehem and see marvel be amazed ponder in your hearts the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it John 1 5 post tenebrous lux you know what that means after darkness light that's Christmas Now you wish you could end the story there and say they all lived happily ever after, right? All great stories end like that, right? But we know in this fallen world that we live in, the story doesn't end there. With the great joy that Jesus brought into the world, there's still sorrow and heartbreak. The enemy holds that deep darkness over our heads. Yeah, there's great joy. Yes. And then comes that old man, Simeon, who's about to depart into peace. And he says to the child's parents, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. His presence will reveal the thoughts of many hearts. This child will begin sifting. He will be the aroma of life and joy and light to some 
and the aroma of death and misery and darkness to others. And then you know what he says, his last words to those parents before going off to die? He says to the mother, a sword will pierce your own soul. Great joy, yes. But a sword is coming that will cut deeper into that teenager's heart than you could ever imagine. And that young teenager girl pondered those words in her heart. And that's not the only sword in this story. Yeah, great joy, great joy. And elsewhere in Bethlehem, there's another young woman bearing children and nursing newborns. And a few short years later, those women will have soldiers coming from a wicked and desperate king who will break down their doors and pierce those toddlers with their sword. Undoubtedly, one of the darkest nights ever in their lives and in human history. Yeah, there's great joy. But somewhere in Capernaum, there's a young boy who is paralyzed and will lay on a mat for his whole life while he watches his friends, his good friends, play, wishing that he could take up his mat and walk. Yeah, there's great joy. And somewhere in the country of Gerasim, there's a man in a few years, his life will start to spiral out of control and the thousands of evil voices in his head will begin to overwhelm him until they imprison him in his own body. Yeah, there's great joy. And somewhere in Galilee, there's a young woman walking the streets. In about 18 years, she's going to start bleeding and it won't stop. And she'll spend over a decade seeking relief from doctors. After doctor after doctor after doctor, all who will only take her money and make it worse. Yes, there's great joy. And yet in Capernaum, there's a young man named Jairus who aspires to one day be a ruler in the synagogue. In about 18 years, he'll have a daughter, the apple of his eye, and 12 years after that, he will watch as she begins to waste away by some unstoppable illness. And then she will die while he's out making one last desperate attempt to get help. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. But neither does the darkness disappear. And that's not all. 2,000 years later, in a land of deep darkness, a great variety of people will be gathered to hear the Christmas story at the darkest time of the year. And each one of them will have different swords piercing their soul. Each sword is different. Yeah, there's great joy. But there's families who are torn about by relational strife and incurable conflict. Yes, there's great joy, but families and individuals reckoned with the long-term consequences of substance abuse and childhood trauma and marital unfaithfulness. Yes, there's great joy, but families and individuals face the uncertainty of the future, the loss of the job as the bills pile up and the savings run out. Yes, there's great joy. But unmarried men and women long and yearn to find someone to share their lives with and fulfill their loneliness. And they fulfill their loneliness in sinful ways. Yeah, there's great joy. But heavy-hearted couples silently bear the burden of infertility, grieving that God hasn't answered their prayers as he did for Sarah and Rachel and Hannah and Elizabeth. Yeah, there's great joy, but young couples experience a shocking emotional whiplash of miscarriage. 
Yes, there's great joy, but people young and old face life-changing diagnosis of cancer and strokes and heart attacks and genetic disorders. Yeah, there's great joy, but individuals and families reckon with crippling anxiety, inexplicable depression, and sometimes a darkness so deep that the desire to live is overwhelmed and the will to go on is extinguished. Yeah, there's great joy, but there's parents who ache for their children who are wandering from the Lord. And there's children who are aching for their parents who are wandering from the Lord. There's great joy, but families grieve the loss of mom or dad or brother or sister or son or daughter who still lie buried beneath the land of deep darkness. What is Advent? Advent is the season before Christmas. What kind of season is Advent? Advent is the season of waiting. Where are we waiting? In a land of deep darkness. What are we waiting for? The light to shine upon us. What do we do during Advent? Prepare our hearts to welcome Jesus. What do we confess during Advent? Christ has come, and Christ will come again. Advent is a reminder that in this life, in this land of deep darkness, the great joy of Christmas is never without sorrow. The major key of triumph and joy contains the minor key of grief and affliction. The curse that hangs over this broken world is real, but the story is true. I want to give great joy for all the people. I'm here to bring you good news of great joy. There is a Savior. He is Christ the Lord. He has come to make his blessings flow. Far from the curse <clears throat> is found. I want you to remember that whatever sword is presently piercing your soul, the nails pierced his hands, the spear pierced his side for you. His body is for you. His blood is for you. He is for you. So come and behold him. Come, let us adore him. The beginning of Advent started way back in Genesis. When the depravity of man, the evil in his heart, the ugly sin of man caused God to say, I am sorry I even created them. Right there, God already knew he had a plan to redeem them. He had a plan to take man out of the deep darkness and to shine the light of Jesus on him. This is what Advent represents. Not only that first time that he sent the light in the form of an innocent baby, but also when Jesus, the man, returns to gather his children. And when he returns, that light will be judgment. That light will reveal everything. For all that is secret will eventually be brought into the open. And everything that is concealed will be brought to light and made known to all. This is what we celebrate at Advent. Yes, we celebrate the coming of Jesus as a baby in remembrance to that great event. That event changed the world more than any other event. Well, maybe, I don't know, that and the crucifixion, right? Change the world more than any other events ever, right? But we also prepare and we anticipate the return of our Lord and Savior. We're looking forward to something better. Looking forward to something better. And it's coming our way soon. 
We're looking forward to that day when that deep darkness is gone forever. And you know the only thing that remains? The light. This should give us hope. This should give us purpose in our lives. This should give us joy and peace. In fact, wouldn't you agree that light gives us everything? So enjoy this season of Advent. I hope I've given you some reminders as why we celebrate ahead of that actual great day we call Christmas. We know of all of those stories in Scripture. We know of all of those things that go in our world today. We know of all that deep darkness. And for most of us in the audience, we've already received the light, right? But we're still looking forward to His return. So Advent is both a remembrance of the past, but also a looking towards the future. So spend the rest of your month celebrating and praising God for His amazing and awesome gift of Jesus Christ. Now I'd be remiss after a message like that if there were someone in this audience that hasn't experienced that coming of light into their life yet. It's so amazing that God has made it so easy. What do you have to do? You just have to first of all confess that you're a sinner. That you've fallen short. And I think every one of us would agree to that. And then you have to acknowledge that Jesus is who He said He was. He's the Son of God. You have to acknowledge that He died for your sins. You have to acknowledge that because He was God, He had the power to raise from the dead. And you have to acknowledge that He gives that free gift to you. That when you die in this life, you will have an eternal life with God in heaven. Simple prayer. Just acknowledge those things to God. God, I'm a sinner. I believe in Jesus. I believe all the works that He did. I believe He died for my sin. I accept Your free God gift. I want to live with You forever in heaven. It's that simple. If you need to make that commitment today for the first time, come see me after the service. I'd love to share with you and talk to you about that. If you're already a believer, then this should be a great celebration this month, right? Looking forward to the return of our Savior. You should wake up every morning praising God if you don't already. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Worship team, you want to come up and close us out this morning? Why do we send a team to Guatemala? Because we want to bring that light. We want to bring that light to those people in another part of the world. Why do we support Ukraine? I mean, no. Our pastor Catalan in Romania, who's going into Ukraine. Yeah, we want to bring resources to people who have been hurt, but we want to bring the light, right? Don't we want to be an Advent church? A church that is anticipating the return of Christ a church that speaks that message to the world so that others can come to the light as well. Worship team. If you wish to remain seated, that's fine. If you would like to stand, please stand. Grab your hand, look.
We're going to go to number 10, How Great Thou Art.
You say, God is good, God is great. Let us not forget that. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.